it, in 10 years, do you think it'll still be something like a transformer, but with a much more modified attention and more sparse uh, MLPs and so forth? Well, the way I like to think about it is, okay, let's uh, translation invariance in time, right? So 10 years ago, where were we? 2015, uh, we had uh, convolutional neural networks yeah. primarily. Residual networks just came out. Um, so remarkably similar, I guess, but quite a bit different still. I mean, transformer was not around. Um, you know, all the um, all these sort of like more modern uh, tweaks on the transformer were not around. So maybe some of the things that we can bet on, I think, in 10 years uh, by translational <laughs> sort of equivariance is um, we're still training giant neural networks with uh, forward, backward pass and update through gradient descent. Um, but maybe it looks a little bit different mm. and it's just everything is much bigger. Actually, recently, I uh, also went back all the way to 1989, which was kind of a fun uh, exercise for me a few years ago, uh, because I was reproducing uh, Jan LeCun's 1989 convolutional network, which was uh. the first neural network I'm aware of trained via gradient descent, like modern neural network trained gradient descent on uh, digit recognition. Mm. And I was just interested in, okay, how can I modernize this? How much of this is algorithms? How much of this is data? How much of this progress is uh, compute and systems? And I was able to very quickly, like half the learning rate, just knowing by tra time travel by 33 years. So if I time travel by algorithms to 33 years, I could adjust what Jan LeCun did in 1989, and I could basically half the learning, half the error. But uh, to get further gains, I had to add a lot more data. I had to like 10x the training set. And then I had to actually add more uh, computational optimizations. Uh, had to basically train for much longer mm. with dropout and other regularization techniques. And so it's almost like all these things have to improve simultaneously. So, um, you know, we're probably going to have a lot more data. We're probably going to have a lot better hardware. Probably going to have a lot better kernels and software. We're probably going to have better algorithms. And all of those, it's almost like no one of them is winning too much. All of them are surprisingly equal. <laughs> <laughs> mm. And this has kind of been the trend for a while. So I guess to answer maybe your question, I expect differences uh, algorithmically to what's happening today. Uh, but I do also expect that some of the things that have st stuck around for a very long time will probably still be there. It's probably still giant neural network trained with gradient descent. That would mm. be my guess. It's surprising that all of those things together only have mm. um, uh, half the error. Yeah. Which is, so like 30 years of progress is, uh, maybe maybe half is a lot because like if you half the error, that actually means that... Half is a lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but it's, I guess what was shocking to me is everything needs to improve across the board. Yeah. Uh, architecture optimizes a loss function and also has improved across the board forever. So I kind of expect all those changes to be well, alive and well. well yeah, actually, I, I was about to ask you a very similar question about NanoChat because mm -hmm. since you just coded up recently, every single sort of step in the you know, process of building a chatbot is like fresh in your RAM. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm curious if you had similar thoughts about like, oh, there was no one thing that was relevant to going from GPT-2 to NanoChat. Uh, like what, what are uh, sort of like surprising takeaways from the experience? Oh, building NanoChat? Yeah. So NanoChat is a kind of a repository I released, was it yesterday or mm -hmm. the day before? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we can see this lead narration that went into the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's just trying to be a... It's trying to be the simplest, complete repository that covers the whole pipeline end-to-end -end yeah. of building a ChatGPT clone. And so, you know, you have all of the steps, not just any individual step, which is a bunch of, I worked on all the individual steps sort of in the past and really small pieces of code that kind of um, show you how that's done in algorithmic sense um, uh, in like simple code. But this kind of handles all the entire pipeline. I think in terms of learning, it's not uh, it's not so much, um, I don't know that I actually found something that I learned from, from mm -hmm. it necessarily. I kind of already had in my mind as like how you build it. And this is just a process of mechanically uh, building it and making it clean enough and uh, so that people can actually learn from it and um, that uh, they find it useful. Yeah. If you enjoyed this clip, you can watch the full episode here and subscribe for more clips. Thanks.